Bethany North. Welcome to Online Worship. I'm so glad that you're able to join us today. Uh, my name is Michelle Woody, and I want to invite you to a time and a space where we bring our worship before the Lord. Um, we do this because our God is worthy of our songs. He's worthy of our remembrance. And all throughout scripture, we're called to do this. But what I love about this time is that even when we come and we pour out ourselves, we don't leave this space empty. God is so faithful to meet us when we come with all that we are. When we come, He fills us, He restores us, He encourages our hearts. So may we come, however we may be this morning, in joy or in pain, worried or relieved, however you are, just come with all that you are and bring it before the Lord. We're gonna sing one of my favorite hymns, is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I love what it says, tune my heart, tune my heart like an instrument to sing of the grace that you've shown. So let's, let's come to him and let's sing. to get to worship together with you today. Uh, if you're new here, uh, welcome. We are so excited you're here with us and we would love to get to know you. You can use the QR code that should be on your screen now and fill out one of our connect cards and we'll be in touch, welcome you. If you have prayer requests, you can fill it out as well. Um, we would love to get connected. And speaking of getting connected and our community, please watch this video from our deacons ministry to learn a little bit more about what they do. Hi, 
I'm Katie Santiago and I am currently the lead deacon coordinator for the deacon ministry here at Bethany North. Deacon ministers are a group of Bethany attendees and members who care for the practical and tangible needs of our congregation. So what that looks like is that we bring meals when families have a new baby or get it, have an injury or are su suffering and dealing with a hardship that that the, the care of bringing a meal and not having to think about what am I going to make for dinner? When am I gonna go grocery shopping? All of us human beings want wholeness and connection, and those of us who are believers want connection to the body of Christ. Knowing that there's someone doing life alongside us, not just in a crisis, but also day to day for conversation and prayer, mutual support, talking through things that make you mad <laughs> about a sermon or a worship song that annoys you or that you really love. just. Just things, you know, doing life together and having conversation, that's a little harder to connect to. Um, the deacons actually always ask whether someone reaching out for care is in a small group or connected in some way, but sometimes it isn't possible with the person's life circumstances or their work schedule just doesn't allow them to be part of something like that right now. So I think as I've been reflecting on it, I think that that's a call for everyone that not just in deacon ministry and not just because you had an injury or a surgery or a baby, care. Care for the people that you've been connected to in the past that maybe you've lost track of and reach out, reach out to somebody and make sure that no one's being left or falling in the cracks. So if you want to get involved or if you have any questions about our deacons ministry, please email uh, the email on your screen, uh, our North Deacons. They'll be happy to answer any questions you have and get you connected. It's a wonderful ministry uh, that has really blessed many people in our community, including myself. Also, some more announcements. One of the things that has been awesome about the space that we've been in for our in-person services is we now have access to classrooms to have children's ministries. So I have, so we have both preschool and elementary kids classrooms again. Um, and we have some fantastic volunteers uh, that are on those teams and we're looking to have more people join us. So if you're interested, you can either email me or uh, you can sign up on our website at churchbcc.org slash serve. Also, uh, we send out newsletters, children's ministry, youth ministry, family ministry. And we've recently changed up what our newsletters look like. So we now send out weekly newsletters for children's ministry, which is zero to fifth grade, uh, weekly emails for youth ministry, which is sixth through 12th grade, and then once a month emails for family ministry, which covers all of that. So if you're interested in receiving those newsletters, you can email Lauren. Her email is on the screen uh, for you to reach out to her so you can make sure you're on those lists. Finally, I want uh, to pray for us as we enter into our giving moment because it's a fantastic way that we get to worship God and serve God's people together uh, in the ways that we are able to share the gifts that God has given us, whether that is our time, our treasure, our talent, whatever it is that God is calling you to share with the church in this season. Uh, we thank you for the ways that you support our community. So let me pray for us. Dear God, thank you so much for your goodness for your faithfulness, for the way that you are always at work in our lives, um, especially in those times where we can't see it. Uh, God, thank you for your church and for your community and the way that you invite us into relationship. Uh, we pray that what we bring to you, uh, our time, our talents, our finances, all of ourselves, that you would use those to further your kingdom. 
Um, it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship. Who else would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine?
the earth All the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing I'm Nathan, the youth director here, and right now it's time for the kids' story. So I have invited my friend Michelle to uh, help us with an activity to tell today's story. So I've given Michelle a blindfold, and so you can go ahead and blindfold yourself, Michelle. And while she ties it, uh, this is just a great opportunity to point out the merits of reusing, because this used to be my sweat rag when I was on the PCT. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't at all. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give Michelle a series of objects, and then ask her which one stands out to her the most. Okay. okay. So blindfold on. Yep. All right. So here comes the first object. I can. Okay. Okay. I'll oh. take it back. Here's the second one. Okay. Which one stands out? Yes, at the end, I'll ask you which one stands out to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. And now, 
Okay. Okay. All so right. before I ask you, Michelle, which one really stood out to you, yeah. I want kids at home to take a guess. Which of those four do you think really stood out to Michelle? All right. Let's see. Which one was it? The last one. Yeah, probably the fourth one, yeah. the hammer. Pretty different than all of the other spheres that I handed her. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. You can go ahead and untie that. You can, you can keep it. I don't need the sweat rag anymore. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But that brings us to today's story. Because today's story is a time in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus really stood out from the crowd, almost like the hammer and that activity we just did. Let me explain. You see, Jesus had started his ministry. and He was going around and he was healing people and teaching people. And everyone was amazed at what he was doing. And then Jesus came to his hometown, Nazareth, where he grew up. And he did something there that made him stand out a little bit. So while everyone was gathered, all of his family and his friends, all of his childhood neighbors, Jesus got up in front of them and unrolled the scroll of Isaiah, who was a prophet in the Old Testament. And he found this list of all the good things the Messiah was gonna do for the people. And he read that list. He said, the Messiah is gonna proclaim good news to the poor. It's gonna proclaim freedom to the prisoners, restore sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's a pretty good list of things, if you ask me. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll and said, today in your hearing, this is fulfilled. He was telling them that he was the Messiah. And that's a way to stand out from the crowd, if you ask me. But what do you think that the people did? All of his friends, his family, his neighbors all gathered there. Well, they all probably looked at each other and then they said, wait, isn't this Joseph's son? Another way you can understand that is, shouldn't he just be trying to fit in here? Maybe being a little bit more like a grapefruit or a, a spike ball, less like a hammer standing out as much as he is? Well, Jesus knew what God wanted him to do. And he stayed true to that, even when the people around him uh, were even got angry with him. And that's a lesson for us too, that following God is more important than just fitting into the crowd. Thank you for listening and let's pray. Dear God, I pray that this week you will meet us and give us the courage and wisdom to follow you, uh, even if it means that we have to stand out. Thank you, God, for walking with us uh, each and every day. Praise in Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Job chapter 16, verses 1 through 21. It says, Then Job replied, I've heard many things like these. Miserable comforters are you all. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I also could speak like you if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you but my mouth would encourage you. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. Yet if I speak, my pain is not relieved. And if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, O oh God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have bound me and has become a witness. My gauntness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me his piercing eyes. Men open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. God has turned me over to evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping. Deep shadows ring my eyes. Yet my hands have been free of violence and my prayers is pure. 
O earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tears to God, on behalf of a man, he pleads with God as a man pleads for his friend. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Scott, and this is my wife, Heather. And uh, our sermon today is out of the book of Job. We're in this series, Embracing Mystery. Our title today is called Presence in Pain. Presence in Pain, as we unpack relationships in the midst of suffering. Title today, Presence in Pain. Will you pray with me now? Lord God, thank you so much for these moments ahead to learn more about how to be present uh, in the midst of suffering. And God, we would ask that this message would build relationships in your church, relationships from us to you, from us to ourselves, to us, from us to others. God, we want to grow in relationships, which we know have struggled so mightily in this season. So bring us a word of hope, of peace, of consolation uh, from this book of Job. Uh, in your name we pray, God. Amen. So uh, presence in pain, we're joined today by Heather, my spouse of 20 years, my best friend, my inspiration, also a therapist, a licensed marriage and family therapist, owner of a practice of other therapists. She's an expert in relationships. So she has a lot to teach us today as we talk about presence in pain, because presence is a gateway towards healing as we learn to be present to ourselves and to God and to others. So Heather's an expert in relationships, and she's a woman who has known grief and suffered the loss of her full-term baby, our full-term baby, Fisher Samuel, 13 years ago. And um, so what did it look like for Heather to hold on to faith and hold on to relationship in the midst of her suffering. So she's a subject matter expert in a couple of different uh, ways. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Well, as we look at Job, we're obviously looking at a book of suffering, and Job is a book that seems to have no answers, doesn't it? It seems like there's a lot of questions. And the very point of Job seems to be that often there's no answers. This is the very essence of life, isn't it? We go through pain, we go through struggle, and we wonder why. Um, And yet we still look for, and I think can find, some answers in Job, or rather some wisdom and some guidance, uh, comfort, and important truth where the answers actually seem to elude us. One overall theme here is the importance of our presence, which can be so difficult in the face of great pain. Um, I would say there's a universal feeling of inadequacy of words when we or others go through great loss. Everyone feels anxious in those times when those that we love are hurting and we so want to comfort them and we know we don't have the right words to say. We want to somehow make it better We want to comfort, we want to relieve them of their pain, and we want to give answers in order to do that. And that's with the best of intentions, and yet often our desire to give answers can actually circumvent the comfort we can offer with our presence, which is really a profound concept. What does it look like to be present to pain? Yeah, and if you're just joining us, you haven't caught all of our sermons in the Job series, welcome. You're you're not behind at all, but just to give a little bit of context, Job, the greatest man in the East, Job 1, chapter uh, 1, verse 1, uh, suffered a great loss. He lost 10 kids. He and his wife did. We're going to talk about her in a moment. Uh, suffered a loss of his health and his property and held on to his faith. But then increasingly, as his three friends show up to sit in suffering with him, that starts this dialogue where each of the three friends shares and then Job shares. This happens in three rounds. And 35 chapters of Job are about relationships, are about these friends trying to make sense of it. And last week we talked about this as kind of a part one about how to be a friend in suffering, but this larger context of relationship really undergirds the whole of Job. And the reality is that suffering often destroys relationships. So often suffering destroys marriages or friendships or church communities. We see this in COVID, we see this in the loss of baby, like we see this everywhere. So often when people suffer, relationships with God and with others and ourselves get destroyed. So that's kind of some context of why we're starting today with this element of presence. Mm -hmm. 
If the Bible is there to teach and guide us, and Job happens to be in the Bible, I think that there's some guidance we can get out of it. It's actually called wisdom literature, mm -hmm. right? And I do believe there are profound truths in what seems to be a very, you know, confusing book um, that seems to be senseless in suffering. But doesn't it feel like all suffering on some level is senseless? Like, why does this need to happen, God, is what we're all looking for. Yet, we can look at Job for some wisdom. And I think the big idea here is how do we endure suffering by being present to ourselves? And I'll talk about that a little bit. Present to God and then present to others, which is uh, detailed in Job. We see all three of these. It's Job in the beginning and throughout, we see some presence to himself. And what does that mean? Uh, you know, if you've been in therapy or if you've met anybody in therapy, you've heard the term self-care. And often I hear people, uh, especially in Christian circles, wonder, you know, where does self-care fall? Is this self-indulgence? Is this maybe somehow selfish? Um, I am a therapist and I would of course argue that, but I wanna give you a biblical perspective of self-care. And this is our presence to ourselves, our presence to our own bodies, our own soul, our own spirit is actually presence to God within us. God created us to be a temple. He created us in bodies to experience and worship and connect with Him. And I think He also has something to say in the ways that we feel pain, both in our bodies and in our emotions. And we pay attention to that. We are paying attention to God within us. Mm -hmm. He wants us to pay attention to our desires. He wants us to pay attention to our delight. This is not self-indulgence. This is our joy coming forth. He wants us to pay attention to the needs of our body, the ways that we need rest the ways that we are hungry, the ways that we maybe need endorphins. Do we need to move our bodies? Do we need to have sex? Do we need to explore pleasure? Do we need to have some downtime? Do we need to shut things down? How often do we push through pain, right? How often do we go through the day and think, I, I especially remember this when we had little ones around the house. I, I couldn't even remember when I ate sometimes. I don't even remember if I ate um, or went to the bathroom. I had to pee hours ago. And Scott would say, how do you do that? <laughs> Just shuts down, you know? Those of us that are parents in the room or for anybody who's been a caretaker of others, our needs can become secondary and yet God is inviting us to presence to ourselves, And so in this moment right now, I want you to think about, well, first and foremost, Job sets an example for us, right? Job doesn't get back to work. He doesn't pull up his bootstraps and start planting that next field or having more kids. For 35 chapters, he's sitting with the pain and he's mm -hmm. present to That's it. So good. I want you to think about in this moment right now, even close your eyes, take a deep breath, and in a moment of mindfulness, I want you to listen to your body right here and right now. Is there a pain? Is your neck sore? Is your back aching? Is there a hunger? Do you need food? Do you need water? What is your body telling you that it needs right here, right now? And as you think of this, invite God into this moment as a way to connect to the presence of God. I would argue that our presence to our bodies is first and foremost our connection to God. And I'll share a quote by Stephanie Paulzell who wrote, Honoring the Body. The Christian practice of honoring the body is born of the confidence that our bodies are made in the image of God's own goodness. As the place where the divine presence dwells, our bodies are worthy of care and blessings. It is through our bodies that we participate in God's activity in the world. Mm -hmm. Self-care is not selfish. It is stewardship of one of the greatest gifts God has given us of presence to ourselves. Wow, it's so good. I feel like just you drawing that connection of Job, not rushing back to building the next barn, but just being present to his suffering himself is so helpful. Um, you know, I come to think Job's experience of Jesus in Matthew 11 said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so in presence to self, there's this invitation of like a great exchange for the stuff that we carry. And Jesus said, I, I, I can carry that with you, for you, if you can just be present to what's um, going on within you, to being open to, like you said, the 
uh, the presence of our own pain. In some regards, it's kind of a releasing of control of saying, God, I, I want to stop carrying this burden alone. I want to, I want to bring you into it. Um, and this has application deeper than for folks, maybe some of you are like right in the midst of suffering. So what Heather's saying is like, this is so good. Like, you know, I need to just see if I can survive today. For many others watching, maybe you're not at the absolute rock bottom right now, um, but you've been there or you're caring for someone or, but you know, maybe you're in a season where it's just more in this middle space. And I was talking to a friend even yesterday and he just reminded me about like, where's God in the middle times too? He, the times of not horrible, but not great. Like, how do we pay attention to what's happening within us so that we keep growing in intimacy with God and with ourselves and with others, even when we're just, we're not thriving? Um, he was saying on the phone, he's like, you know, I just went through a season of kind of, of kind of darkness, a little bit of depression. And I said, well, tell me about that. And he said, you know, I was asking these questions. I'm, I'm doing good, but I don't really feel God. Or I feel successful, but I don't feel content. And then he said this line and just like, boom, it popped for me. He said, Scott, you can only fake it for so long. And I, and I had to take care of myself. And so he booked some time away. He went and connected with God. He got some outside resources and he's entered back into his life into a place of a lot more hopefulness. So presence to self, so key. The second thing we're gonna go into here is presence to God. Mm -hmm. How do we be present to God? Yes, the second example that we see Job and Job's wife and others is this presence to God and really receiving God's presence to us. And so how do we do this when we're suffering and we're struggling? And sometimes God feels naturally far away in these moments. And I think we can come freely to God with our lament. And in fact, he invites us to. We cry out in our suffering and we invite him in as a friend. And we'll talk later a little bit about how friendship works in times like this. But God, we can see in sort of that friendship realm of a, of a trusted person who can listen and cares for us. A prayer practice I want to invite you into is something that I've recently learned. I've been participating in the Transforming Community with Ruth Haley Barton's ministry. It's a two-year cohort experience, two and a half years of quarterly retreats and spiritual practices. And I've been reading one of the books uh, by David Brenner called Opening to God that invited me into this new prayer practice that I really see Job and, and others doing here, where you come to God without kind of your laundry list or your Christmas wish list uh, or your confession list even, but you speak to him as you would a friend just about the circumstances of your day. You talk about, you know, naturally kind of the highs and lows and the ins and outs and just the narrative story of your day is a really special and intimate. I've been practicing this and it's, um, it's a really good prayer practice in times of suffering. And we actually see Job do just this with God, which I find refreshing. He comes to God and he says in Job 7.20, if I have sinned, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do, why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? I mean, there's intimacy there, right? That's coming to God with sort of irreverence, right? Of just, here's where I'm at. And God can hear that. And in fact, I think it invites an intimacy that God is inviting us into by uh, saying that this is just where I'm at today. This is like a good marriage. This is a safe friendship. This is a best friend you can go to um, or a parent to a child. There's safety when attachment is secure to say, this is hard. Why did you do this? You're hurting me. And safe bonded attachment relationships can handle that because we can be present to each other's pain. I want to invite you to another experience of this with Job's wife, who does it a little differently. And I think she kind of gets a bad rap sometimes. But if you look at what she's saying, Job's wife comes to God directly with, well, comes to Job, but also to God with her direct lament. She says, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. This is Job 2.9, which might sound like, why are you doing this, God? It's her true lament. Guess what? She just lost 10 children. Mm -hmm. She just lost everything alongside Job. Mm -hmm. Her loss is as significant as mm -hmm. Job's. And she's saying, I'm not happy about it. And God can hear that. This other prayer practice that some of you may have already be experiencing is the prayer of eczema, which you simply pay attention to that. 
consolation and the desolation of your day. And this comes from St. Ignatius of Loyola. And this was a prayer practice. He invited people into more contemplative experiences of connection to God and to service to the world. But in this prayer of eczemon, we simply end our day saying, God, this is where you showed up to comfort me. And this is where today was hard or painful. And you pay attention to this and you see themes show up. I first learned this as a young adult at MDiv student. I was graduate school uh, studying Masters of Divinity work at Fuller Seminary and I was invited to a prayer practice. And I thought this is brilliant to have a high and low and really, that's all it is. Some of you are doing this with your families already, and it's a really beautiful way of connecting. And what's beautiful about this experience is when somebody knows that they're going to be asked at the end of the day on a regular basis, we can get through those tough experiences even better. When a kiddo knows and when an adult knows, I can share this later with somebody who loves me, they just went through something hard. I can log that, but I can cope with it. And I can be with somebody later who is present to my pain and that is really healing. Mm -hmm. And that's really beautiful. Even in work settings, I would say this can, this can apply. Um, this is where we can say, I have seen you, God. And God can say, I see you. My 12-year-old has begun doing this. Uh, she'll you know, experience maybe some anxiety through the day, and at the end of the day, she'll write down her highs and her lows, and we'll chat about it. And she's seeing how God is working through those difficult points in her life, and she's seeing where God is showing up. Sometimes when you're in great suffering, it's hard to find those nuggets, mm -hmm. and they're like little breadcrumbs on mm -hmm. a path. But I encourage you to pay attention because I do know through our own experience this is where God shows up. Mm -hmm. And these little nuggets of sustenance can get us through. Yeah, and this is what the book's about. It doesn't explain the why of suffering. It explains how to get through suffering and hold on to your faith. In this regard, like what Heather's talking about, presence to God doesn't fix pain, but we have a partner in the pain. And I go to Jesus' ministry in John 11 at the passing of Lazarus. Jesus heard his friend of Lazarus was sick. And listen to John 11, 3. The, the, the sisters, Mary and Martha, sin word, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus loves Lazarus. And then incredibly, Jesus waits. He doesn't wave a wand. He doesn't wish away the pain. He waits. It says, when Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard Lazarus was sick, get ready, Jesus stayed where he was two more days. And if you're like me, you read that like, what? Jesus, what are you doing? The one you love is sick and Jesus waits. In Jesus' ministry, he won't always follow our desires or be understandable to human wisdom. It's the same as Job. Job 5, 9, Job says, God, you do great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. But the subcontext there in Job 5 is, but God, I don't understand you. We won't always understand but in presence to God, we're bringing God into the places of awareness and pain and suffering because that's what it means to hold on to your faith in the midst of really hard times. Jesus shows up at the grave of Lazarus, not to minimize pain, but to bring himself and to bring new life. And he says, roll the stone away. And even then there's this dramatic pause. And then Lazarus comes out. Lazarus is alive, but it's a temporary resurrection because we live in a world that's passing away. So Lazarus was saved, but he wasn't given a get out of jail free card. Like later in life, Lazarus would die again. All life on this side of eternity is learning to deal with loss and lament and a passing and a beauty. And a, I mean, it, it, your favorite book, Ecclesiastes. It's like life is short and God is still good. So in presence to God, we can hold on to our belief. And that's hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you had that experience where somebody asked you, like, do you still believe? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, soon after we lost our son Fisher, um, a group of friends went out, uh, you know, just to have a girls' night. And there, there was a friend in the group who was not a Christian and very kindly and with curiosity asked me about my faith and, and in essence said, you know, well, then you, you, you probably don't believe that anymore, right? Um, and I, you know, I sort of was taken aback because I thought, gosh, this is, this is what's getting me through. Um, but I understand the nature of the question because what, in essence, she was saying is, well, when you believe in this construct of religion, you're protected from bad things, right? And that was her perception of what it meant to be a Christian. I said, I don't 
oh, no, no. <laughs> if you look at the Bible, it's all kinds of suffering, mm-hmm. but there is presence mm-hmm. of God with us in that. And that to me was actually a comfort mm-hmm. that I had been it, aware of these stories of suffering mm-hmm. in the Bible. And when I learned of my son's death, mm-hmm. instead of thinking, why me? I literally thought, well, why not me? Because mm-hmm. bad things do happen, mm-hmm. but I do have hope that I'm gonna get through this. Yeah. So it's presence to self and then presence to God. And then we're gonna finish here with this presence to others because being a Christian, Job is learning through community here. We know how much our Christian community has been disrupted in COVID. We live with so much disruption right now, but what does presence to others look like mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. gateway towards healing or just surviving in grief mm-hmm. and pain? Well, you're speaking my language, Scott. Mm-hmm. This is why I do what I do. Um, there is profound healing that can happen in presence to others, especially in times of pain. It's literally what I live my life doing as a therapist. Um, And it's a sacred space to enter into. The same practice of experience with God and with self can be experienced with others. Job is a story about relationships, and there's a lot of relationship uh, constructs and advice that we can get from this. The friendships, the marriage, and the family experience of Job are a big part of the narrative. We can be intentional to offer and to receive sharing that pain with others in order to lessen the pain. I have this little um, cartoon image that is in the back office of our Navigate Family Therapy offices where just the clinicians see it. But it's this image of a brain that's all jumbled up and it looks like just a spaghetti, you know, all jumbled up. And on the other side is, you can tell this person is talking, is the therapist figure sitting in a chair and holding this really nicely uh, wound up ball of yarn that's very organized. And the idea is in the presence of others, when we feel jumbled and like we can't handle life and it feels all out of control, and then we share that in the presence of a reflecting, validating, empathizing other, we can feel that sense of being seen and heard and known in really profound ways that calms us and organizes us and makes us feel secure again. And this is what we see happening in Job or the message of Job, so to say. John Gottman of the University of Washington has done some extensive research on this idea that couples who spend time every day, 10 to 15 minutes just checking in, have better relationships. Now this can apply across the board. This can apply to friendships. This can apply apply to parents and children. This can apply in work. I I do some professional business consulting sometimes, and a man that I worked with was given a promotion from an individual IT position to leading a team, and basically came to me like, what do I do? I'm not used to working with people, and talked about some of the struggles that some of his employees were facing. And he said, how do I engage this? This person, for example, has somebody in their family dying of cancer. Uh, And so they're not maybe showing up in the ways I need them to. And so my advice was, ask them about it and then move on to the work. You don't have to spend all day on it. But our presence to the humanity of other people is profoundly impactful. I encourage you, if you're not doing this already, start your staff meetings, your team meetings, your one-on-ones or your groups with a simple high-low. It's basic. It's very rudimentary. Keep it time bound and it will transform the dynamic. Keep it personal and then move to the professional and you will have a more engaged and beautiful culture because this is how God wired us to be in relationship. Sharing our hearts with someone who we know is really listening transforms us. And so use words that are validating. You might not have answers and please don't have answers actually. Respond with the words that they use. Say things like, that makes sense, and it's okay that you feel that way. You might ask a deepening question that says you're really listening, not simply that detracts or tells your own story, but something that deepens them, such as, tell me more about that. Or, I heard you say this thing, give me the full story there. Really show your presence in these ways. Tone of voice makes a huge difference. You match the tone of voice of the person. These are little therapist uh, interventions that we use. You match the tone. You match even the emotion you see on their face. Even matching body language is very comforting. So when you don't know what to do, emulate, reflect, validate, and then create the sense of what we call attunement or resonance with another person And that makes everybody feel less alone. There are no answers. There are no solutions. There are no reasons. 
Just maintain that connection and you will be a transformational person in their life. Mm -hmm. You can be this kind of friend and you can seek this kind of friendship in times of suffering. I would say, don't go to the friend that tells their own story and takes it away from you. Go to the friend and you might even say, I just need you to listen. And that's okay. You can give them a little guidance and let them listen and let them have presence to you as well. When we lost Frischer, a friend would call every day in that first month of after his loss and simply just say, how was today? With the assumption and the knowing that it was gonna be awful every single day in those initial days. And that was really grounding for me. This really was sort of an eczema experience where I could say, oh my gosh, I went to the grocery store and I had no idea in the checkout line that the person checking me out was gonna notice that I wasn't pregnant anymore and say, how's your baby? Worst moment of the day. I'm standing in line. I don't know what to say. Do I devastate her with the news that I have? I don't really want to talk about it right now. This person's waiting and I'm just in shock. Mm -hmm. These moments matter when we share them with somebody. Best moment of the day, a friend came by and took my little kiddos, ages two and four, to the park to play and just said, I'm sure they need some playtime. Let me take them with us. And the delight I felt in my kiddos getting to go be kiddos and just have fun was a consolation that I got to share. And the presence with that other person is really powerful. And so I recommend doing these kinds of things as you are going through intense pain, inviting friendship, inviting connection, risking reaching out when you have no words, and risking receiving mm -hmm. when you need it most. This, uh, this is it. And um, presence to ourselves, to God, to others. The interaction between our relationships and our spirituality, friends, they're one and the same. This book teaches us so much. Not about why suffering exists, that we long for that answer, we won't get it. But how to be present and how do we grow in our faith in the midst of what we can't understand? For you, Bethany North, like your church burned two weeks before you were gonna move in. Uh, COVID continued. I mean, let's go on and on and on. Individually, every one of you listening, you have these things that you're carrying, big griefs, little griefs, relationships. The essence of the kingdom of God is relational. We worship a triune God that is constantly self-emptying from father to son to spirit, serving and loving and worshiping, pouring into one another. Christianity is nothing if it's not relational. It, it, the essence of a non-relational gospel, that's called sin. That's called selfishness. So we must be marked with healthy relationship. How? presence. So thank you so much for coming. I feel like we all got like a mini free counseling session. And, uh, uh, but just honestly, like what a gift we're, we're on a journey together. We learn these things together. Uh, we shared together. We're raising kids together. We're grief survivors together. Um, our hope for you church in this season is that your relationships would flourish and we know it has been tough. So may this be a word of encouragement for you to really lean in to where your God's speaking to you right now and that your relationships in season hand would come through this time, not just, not just surviving, but thriving. Job himself, Job 23.10, listen to this as a final word. Job says, God knows the way that I take and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold, gold. Will you pray with me now? Jesus, thank you for your church and your people. Would you grow our relationships, Lord? Would you teach us to just be present to one another? Thank you so much for Heather coming and sharing these words that you've given to her, uh, that we would just continue to grow together as your people. We love you, Lord. Strengthen and encourage us. We ask and we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's close with song.
Thank you so much for joining us from Bethany Online. Uh, final words and our benediction. One last word of encouragement. When people go through suffering or loss, people do it differently and they experience different things. And if anything, we learn from Job. Job, Job's wife, Job's friends. Everybody experiences something different and that's okay. And the more we can create space for the different ways that we grieve, one might be sad, one might be angry, one might be shut down and numb, one might need to go out and run and move their bodies, and the other might just need to lay on the couch. And this is all okay. And in our presence to the differences, we create connection and say, it's okay that you feel that way. So I want to encourage you with that if you're feeling very different from those in your life that are also struggling or grieving. Yeah, and then three questions you want to leave us with? So to encourage you, or if you're in a, a group that you want to share these questions with or on your own, I want to encourage you to think about one, what is one thing your body or longings might be speaking to you about a pain or desire you can be present to? This presence to self. Two, presence to God. Explore the prayer practice this week of simply bringing the circumstances of the day to God or paying attention to the consolation and desolation each day. And try this for a few days. Try this for a week and kind of see how that goes for you. And then three, this practicing the presence with others. This week, reach out to somebody in your life who is suffering. Let them know you're thinking of them and or take time to validate, to listen, to encourage, to comfort. When we lost Fisher, a few people reached out this year and said, I'm hanging the ornament that we rang the bell on my tree and I'm thinking of you. It was a drop in the bucket. Another person sent flowers. Another person said, what's it like that he's 13? Each of those ways of saying, I see you was very comforting. Go and be with others in their pain. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.